Welcome back. Uh, I guess I will... This is probably everybody for now, because it's five minutes in. And we are archiving this, so for the record, your voices are probably going to be in the archive on the Famalab YouTube, so... If you don't want to be recorded, maybe muting yourself is a thing now. Um, there is a chat on WebEx. But uh, hopefully the screen share didn't break at the same time. So it works. Cool. Okay. So I guess we should just about get started. So what I've got open now, I shared in events and classes, there was a Google Drive folder. Um, I can actually pop down the link again if anyone needs it. Um, and this is sort of the, uh, like the chef preparing the dish off screen beforehand kind of thing. So this is eventually what it will look like when we get to the end. Um, oop. Somebody joining, leaving, not sure. Um, looks kind of scary and intimidating, actually really not that bad in the next. Um, so I've done this class as a video before. It was about 45 minutes to walk through modeling on the fire hydrant. So we're going to be doing that this week. And then next week, we'll get into unwrapping and texturing. Um, I need some time to actually look into a few free alternatives to the tools I usually use for that step. But we can go ahead. Um, if anyone hasn't installed or opened Blender now, um, now would probably be a good time. Um, and so I'm going to open up a new document. Um, the other thing that we had in the uh, Google Drive folder, and these links will be put in the description of the YouTube video for anybody who's looking at the archive. Um, there is a link to a PureRef file here. PureRef is like a free and open source um, organizational reference tool for like artists, designers, engineers, and stuff. Basically, you can drag and drop photos into here, either from your computer or just like straight out of your browser. They are full resolution, and it's basically zips it all together like a zip file, but you can organize them, scale them, crop them, add notes. It's really quite useful instead of having just a loose folder of random images that you're trying to use for reference, which can get frustrating. So um, there are some funny references down here that were just kind of there for the fun of it. The main references we're using are going to be up here in the top left, um, mainly these red hydrants as a reference for what we're going to be kind of making. So that for me will be off on my left-hand screen for most of the class, but when I'm pointing to certain things on the screen, I'll bring it back over into the view for people. Um, so that's the PRF file. If you can't download that, there's also a JPEG. I just basically exported a big full res screenshot of that PRF file so people can open it up quickly. Um, so if you open up a new Blender document, you might not have it looking exactly like this. By default, there's usually the default cube in Blender, as well as a camera and a light. In the last class, when we went over the uh, user interface, we went over just deleting the useless objects for the first time, and then going ahead and saving that as your default file, so you don't have to you know, delete a random cube every time you open a new project. The other thing we're going to do this time is I'm going to hover my mouse over one of the corners of the viewport and drag down to get rid of the timeline because we're not doing animation and it just clears up some space in our um, in our workspace. And then the final thing before we get started on modeling is I'm going to go to Edit, Preferences. We did this last week, but for anybody who might have missed that, we're going to go to the add-ons and we want to make sure that loop tools is enabled. So we're going to be using a few of these tools throughout the modeling process. Um, Blender has a lot of add-ons that are built in by default, but are not enabled by default to avoid overwhelming new users. But the loop tools is super useful for modeling hard surface objects, and I use it all the time. So that is going to be uh, enabled throughout this tutorial. Um, if I'm going too fast, somebody cut me off. Um, so starting out, the first thing we're going to do, because a fire hydrant is you know, roughly cylindrical, we're going to add a cylinder to the scene that's going to act as the main body, and then we're going to start pulling out the nozzles off of that. So let me, I have notes going on the other screen, so I make sure to remember what I need to hit, all my talking points I need to hit. So the first thing I'm going to do is add a new object. You can either add from the menu over here, or the shortcut for this is shift a, and it pulls up the same menu just underneath wherever your mouse is on the screen, makes it a little bit quicker and nicer. And I'm going to add a mesh cylinder. And so it adds a cylinder to the scene. 
And down in the bottom left, you'll see there's a little menu that's kind of hidden itself to keep itself like tucked out of the way. I'm going to open this up and it gives me a lot of options for customizing the cylinder. I want 16 vertices for this. It's going to be fairly low poly, which makes it easy to work with. Uh, radius should be probably like 0.2 and a depth or a height of one because that'll make it roughly kind of the tall and squat look of a fire hydrant um, as we play with it. And then the last thing I'm going to do to this one, whoops, I got rid of that menu, but that's fine. I was just going to remove the cap fill. Ooh, ah. So I'll go ahead and delete it and add a new one just to show cylinder cap fill to nothing, so it has open faces on either end, because we'll be making our own top and bottom to the fire hydrant. So as I'm moving around the viewport, I'm using my middle mouse button to pan around, holding shift to orbit. Um, if those keys are flipped for you by default in your uh, navigation preferences, or no, in your key map preferences, you can switch whether or not middle mouse is orbit or pan. Um, I hope I'm not getting away from people, and I hope they can hear me, because WebEx is not good at telling me. Yep, we're here. Cool. Um, so I'm just sort of moving it around. And then if you have a number pad on your keyboard, one, three, and seven jump from front, side, and top views. And you'll see that the little uh, directional icons that shows you your X, Y, and Z, you could also click on those, but it will move around as you use your number pad to switch around. So if you see the view flipping, that's me just using my number keys. So we have a cylinder in scene. This is going to be the basis of the fire hydrant. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to hit tab and go into edit mode. The other way you can do that is to pull up the modes options down at the bottom left. Edit mode, um, we covered this last week, but object mode is just moving and placing objects in your scene to like um, uh, add props into an environment, whereas edit mode is how you actually edit and tweak the geometry of the object. So in edit mode, you'll see that everything is turned orange because I have all of the faces and vertices and everything selected by default. So I'm going to hop to my front view, tap A to select everything, and then G is grab. I'm going to grab, hit Z to constrain it to just the Z axis up and down, and just raise this so it's flat to the floor of the ground. You'll notice that there is a little orange dot here. That orange dot, which is surrounded by the cursor, the 3D cursor can be moved anywhere, but the orange dot stays in place. That orange dot is the origin of an object. The origin is kind of the center of mass of an object in the 3D view, which means that whenever you're rotating, um, rotate is R, you're going to rotate, scale, um, and move an object based on that origin position. Um, so the reason I just took the cylinder and moved it up to be flat on the floor is for a fire hydrant, if I'm placing it in a scene, I'd want the origin, its zero, zero point, to be centered on the base of the fire hydrant. Um, and so I just, by clicking in the scene, I moved the cursor. The cursor is where new objects will be created. Um, so if I scale it down, you'll see that new objects are created at the cursor. To reset the cursor to the world origin, I hold shift and then tap C and it resets the cursor to zero, zero. So new objects would also be then created at zero, zero. So kind of a slow start, but I'm trying to go over lots of things for new people. Um, and then the last thing I'm gonna do before we start modeling is you can see that this looks very you know, faceted and blocky, and that's because we are in the flat shaded mode we want to switch over to um, smooth shading. So I can either go to object and hit shade smooth, or there's a, a special menu under W, which pulls up the same thing, objects context menu, and I'm gonna tell it to shade smooth. And you can see that it, even though 
we can still see it's faceted. It's smoothing out the lighting so that the lighting kind of um, transitions evenly between the faces. So it looks a lot more smooth than the geometry underneath actually is. And that's how a lot of uh, video games make very low poly objects that run efficiently on a GPU look as if they are higher resolution than they actually are is by using normal maps and smoothing techniques like this. Um, the other thing I'm going to do on this object with smoothing is under the object properties over here, I'm going to, sorry, not under that, under the object data properties, little vertices, there's a normals tab and I'm going to hit auto smooth. You won't see anything change or update on the cylinder because it's so smooth to begin with, but if I go ahead and I add a cube just to demonstrate, so let me shade this as smooth, and you'll see that it looks really weird because it's taking 90 degree angles and trying to make them like rounded off like a sphere. But as soon as I hit auto smooth, any angle that is greater than that 30 degree, or less than that 30, no, greater than that 30 degree angle, um, it's trying to keep it straight in my head, will turn into a hard edge again. So if I were to go into edit mode, and make a less than 30 degree angle, you'll notice that the face should suddenly pop into smooth shading. Or if I were to bevel it and make it really smooth looking, you'll see that the rounded edge looks nice and smooth and rounded, but the hard corners that are like 90 degree angles or greater than 30 degree angles become nice hard edges. So it kind of maintains hard edges and smooth edges automatically, which will be useful for our fire hydrant. So now we're going to actually get into properly starting the modeling process. So with my fire hydrant cylinder selected, top tabbing into edit mode, I'm going to be using loop cuts to start um, cutting out the edges to create our front face. So the first thing we're gonna be doing here is making like the front nozzle cap at the very front of the fire hydrant. Um, probably using this as the main reference as we go along so I can keep this on the screen over here. So to add extra geometry onto this cylinder, I'm going to use Control R and you'll see a yellow line pops up. Control R is our loop cut tool. And as soon as I click, I can then slide this loop cut around and move it wherever I want it. The first one I want is gonna be perfectly bisecting the model. So I will tap zero to make it not move at all. It'll be completely centered in the object. So that becomes our midline for the cylinder. And then on top of it, I'm going to add another loop, bring it down. Um, in the bottom left of the screen, you'll notice that it says edge slide and gives a number. So I'm gonna move it down until it looks roughly square, which looks like it happens about 0 0.72, 0 0.7, 0 0.7. And I'll do the same to the bottom, 0.7, but this is having to go up instead of down, so it'll be negative. And I'll repeat the same thing again, 0.7, and underneath 0.7, negative, just so we get a four by four grid for the face, which we're going to turn into the nozzle. So right now I'm selecting vertices. Um, anyone not familiar with geometry in a 3D environment, you have faces, which are the squares in between, edges, which are the lines that make up the faces, and vertices, which are the corners at the edges of, or at the intersection of edges. Down here, we can see that I'm in vertex select mode. There is edge and face select, and these are controlled by the number row one, two, and three. So I'm going to go to face select three, and from the front, I'm going to select holding shift to select multiple faces. I'm going to select the four by four grid at the front. And then with X, I'm going to delete faces. And so now I have a big gaping hole in the front, which we're going to turn into the nozzle. Hopefully not going too fast for anybody. Like if anybody's got any questions or anything, please jump in and tell me to slow down. Um, so with the face punched in for the nozzle on the fire hydrant. I'm going to go down to my sidebar and under edit, you'll see that we have our loop tools, which was the add-on we enabled at the beginning of the course. 
the first one we're going to be using is the circle tool. And what the circle tool will do is take any uh, section of edges that you select and try to force that into a circular shape. So I'm going to select one of these edges. And if I hit or I hold left alt while I select these, it will try to select a full <coughs> loop of faces which in this case, because we have a big gaping hole, it will perfectly select the hole. If it didn't work that way, we'd either hold uh, shift to select those edges manually, or if you hold control while clicking and click two faces, it will actually find the shortest path between those two faces, or those two um, edges, faces, vertices, whatever you had selected, and select everything in between. So if I were to go over here, with my vertex select and do hold control, it would find the shortest path, which in this case it decided was an L shape. Over here, it might do more like a, well, a bigger L shape, but then I could do, it would do like little zigzags. It's trying to figure out the shortest path between two points. So in this case, because we have a loop uh, over a hole, I can literally hold alt and select all of those. And I'm going to hit circle, and it's going to try to make a circle out of it. Now the problem, you can see from the side is it flattened it, which looks hideous and is not useful at all. So I will move my reference photo out of the way for a second. In the bottom left, it popped up a menu again, which are the controls for this tool. And we have flatten enabled. Let's turn off flatten. And now you'll see that it still tries to keep the contours of like the complex curve. It doesn't make as good of a circle from the front profile, but it also doesn't destroy the cylinder from the side profile. So. I'm going to do circle once, and then I'm going to relax it, which then um, kind of smooths the vertices into more of the uh, circular shape that we want. And then I'm going to do circle one last time with the relaxed faces, and that will make a fairly nice circle. So we did circle, turned off flatten, relaxed, and circle again to then just like force them into a more circular shape at the end. And so now we have, it looks kind of like a Muppet, but this will become a fire hydrant. So now we have a hole, we want to start extruding our faces outwards and turning them into our fire hydrant shape. So let me scale this down a little bit, zoom in, and we're just going to be focusing on this fire hydrant shape. So to add extra geometry in a 3D program, the operation is called extrude. And so we have all these tools on the sides, but I'm going to be mentioning the uh, shortcuts as we go along. If you didn't know the shortcut for a tool, hovering over any tool in the toolbar will give you a, um, a little pop-up with um, tooltips. So you can actually see for extrude, um, E is the shortcut for it. For loop cut, as we mentioned earlier, control R is the shortcut for it. So we're going to extrude, and that will pull off some new faces and start dragging them with the mouse. And then I'm going to tap Y, because this is on the Y axis, and it will lock it to just going in and out along the Y axis. And you can see the green line that's been highlighted to, to let me know that I am locked to just that one axis. So I can't go up or down or anything. I'm going to move perfectly perpendicular to uh, the surface. So I'm just going to pull it out a tiny bit. Um, so right now I'm kind of making this rounded transition into the, the nozzle. So I'm going to scale and then tap Y. So I'm scaling just along the Y axis, flatten this out a little bit. We're going to ease it in gently and I'm just going to scale completely and just pull it in towards the middle. And so now we have it kind of tapering and rolling into the face. If I go back to object mode, you can see it's kind of blocky and we've got some hard edges. What we're going to be doing here, I'm going to go to my, looks like a little tool wrench. It's the modifiers panel. I'm going to add a modifier and it's subdivision surface. And I'll turn this up to like level three. And you'll see that everything became a lot smoother. So if I viewport display all edges and show you the wireframe, you'll suddenly see that even though in in, oops, in edit mode, we still only have, you know, the 16 edges and the loop cuts we made. When I go to wireframe, there is a ton of extra edges in there. So what the subdivision surface modifier does is it actually 
adds a bunch of loop cuts and smooths in like a one-step process and modifiers apply dynamically as you are working so you don't have to it's a non-destructive workflow instead of adding extra loop cuts in the edit mode which means i'd have to delete them if i want to remove them if i want to get rid of my subdivision surface i literally just remove the modifier so this is dynamic it's non-destructive it will automatically be smoothing the surface as we go along and the reason I like using the subdivision modifier um, rather than having a really high poly mesh when I'm working in edit mode, um, it's kind of twofold. Um, if you're working on a really low poly object, like you want to take this into a video game engine and you need um, you know, the lower polygon count for performance, you kind of get um, two in one. You're making your low poly that you're actually modeling by hand, and then you have your high poly, um, your high resolution is being dynamically generated. Um, so you're kind of doing both steps at once, because in a game engine, what you'll do is you'll take a high polygon um, hero model, bake down the details from that onto your low polygon model, and then take the textures into the game engine, and it will like do the fake lighting that we're doing right now to make it look like it has higher resolution than it actually does. Um, and then the other reason I like having a lower polygon count in edit mode is you can see that from the side, if I turn on edit mode, you can see that even though my actual faces or my actual vertices are really hard angles, it's smoothing them out and, and allowing me to, with very few control points, get a very smooth deforming surface. It's like having the uh, anchor handles on a vector in Photoshop or Illustrator. You use as few control points as you can, and then those control points give you a nice smooth curvature to your surface. So, continuing from where we left off, again, holding Alt, I will select the whole ring on the front face there. Um, I might have pulled that a little too far, so I might pull that back a little bit further in in my y-axis, and then E to extrude again, grabbing Y, and this time S for scale on the y-axis, and I'm going to tap 0, so it will make it completely and utterly flat in the y-axis. And then I will do circle one more time, so now I have a perfect flattened circle from the front. So now we've smoothly transitioned from the complex compound curvature of the cylinder body and pulled it out into a perfectly flat, um, you know, right angles for the actual cap because the thread and the, the nozzle would actually be at right angles. So the first detail I can see is the cap comes out and then there's like a little shelf here before the threads engage. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to extrude along the y-axis, bring this out a bit, And that's going to be a little bit too long. Loop cut with control R, and then give myself that little thin section that we're going to turn into this little lip. So three for face mode, or the little face selection here. If I hold Alt, it will do a ring selection. Going to extrude, and then immediately click. So I've added new faces because I extruded, but they're sitting on top of the old ones. And the reason I did that is because I'm going to scale it. Now, if I were to scale it normally, you could see that if I were to switch to like the x-ray view, it's also scaled in the y-axis, which means there's a little bit of a slope. But I don't want that because the shelf looks like it's perfectly at, at you know 90 degree right angles. What I want to do is either scale and hold shift y to constrain the y-axis, which would stop it from scaling in the y, or one of the other tools is, uh, where is it in here? Shrink and fatten. Shrink and fatten, the shortcut is Alt S. And what shrink and fatten does is it's like the push pull in Fusion, if you're used to that. It actually pushes and pulls the surface along the normals. So you don't have to worry about constraining it to an axis. It will just make sure that it is pushing and pulling along the normals of the surface, so perpendicular to the faces. I can actually show you under here, if I turn on this display, all those little blue lines are showing you the normals of each face, which is literally, it's just taking the average angle of the face, finding the perpendicular angle. And so if I were to shrink and fatten on any of these, 
they would push and pull along, you know, following those blue lines. And so in this case, when we extruded and then scale, uh, shrank in, we have a perfect flattened 90 degree angle for this little inset lip. And so I'll go back to edge selection, which is two, and then keep going. So we made this little lip. Now there's a big gap before the cap. So let's go ahead. We're going to extrude along the y-axis, make a decently large gap. In fact, this lip might even be too thick here. So let's pull this back and make it thinner. And then the cap itself is a uh, two or three times as long as the gap. So let's make this grab y, oops, grab y, make this like two or three times as long as the cap. And again, extrude, click away immediately so I don't move them, and then shrink to make the cap have its little thing. So we got the lip, little inset, and then the cap. And that might need to be thinned down even, so I will. Go ahead, grab these faces from the back, and make this little bit even thinner. So it's lots of pushing and pulling and trying to figure out what looks right for the references that you have. So back to the front. The cap has a kind of a 90 degree angle here, kind of flattens out. So we will tap extrude, click away again so we don't move it, and scale that in. And so the little ring here with the bolt that hooks onto the chain looks like it's about half the diameter, half the radius of the cap. So that looks about right. So let's extrude this forward. That'll be the cap. Extrude and scale in. That's going to turn into the bolt. And then one more time, this will be the bolt. And it looks like there's a little bit of a lip here, which we'll get to momentarily. So one of the problems that you'll notice having the subdivision modifier applied is it's doing a good job of smoothing things, but maybe too good of a job, because everything now looks like it's made of Play-Doh. It's not sharp enough in the places that it needs to be sharp. So there's a couple ways to solve this. The first method is you, with your loop cut tool, control R, you can add extra loop cuts and push and pull the surface. So it's, you know, you're tightening. These are called holding edges. You're tightening the surface because two edges are close together. So the smoothing is having to smooth, you know, between two very close together um, points of the model. Um, this can be a really good method for uh, tightening up your mesh. Um, the only downside to it being that then when you go to export your low polygon model to your game engine, you're going to want to um, remove all those you know, useless holding edges that won't be needed for your low polygon model in the game engine. Um, the other method that Blender has, and if I go up top here, you can see that there's this thing called mean crease. So if I select a loop, the shortcut for this is Shift E. The mean crease is kind of a a vector weighting tool. And so it kind of tightens or loosens how close the subdivision surface should be pulled towards an edge. If I go all the way up to one, you can see I get a very sharp, like 90 degree edge, perfectly sharp, which you kind of don't want to do on almost anything because in the real world there's always you know some micro bevel um, and especially on something like this where the paint is really thick and blobby you can see that like all the 90 degree edges have these really you know really rounded beveled edges so in this case i'll select it i can either pull down the main crease here or if you do shifty and and uh subtract or shifty and subtract you can remove some of your weighting. So I'm going to set it to zero. And for this, let's see, the cap at the front is very rounded. So maybe half, 0.5 for the front there. 
for the back, maybe 0.75. And we might even turn up our subdivisions a couple of times more just to give us some extra geometry to really show us what we're doing. This can probably even reduce down to like 0.35. There we go. And so I'm going to go back and sharpen some of these edges. So like the cap at the front here, let's say like 0.5, the bottom of the bolt. And it's kind of hard to see if you switch to x-ray view. So I'm using Z to switch between different um, viewport modes, solid, wireframe, x-ray. If you are trying to change these, these are also the viewport modes, um, little bubbles down here. So wireframe, solid, and this is material and rendered. If you don't have this little pop-up window, we covered this in the last class. These are, um, these are called pie menus. It basically reduces the number of shortcuts you need by turning you know, all of your rendered views instead of having a separate shortcut key for each and every one of these. You have a single key that brings up this, this radial menu. If you don't have this, edit, preferences, a tab for a pie menu, uh, extra shading menu pie options. So this is under the key mapping preferences. You want to turn on your pie menus. We covered this in the last one, but in case anybody missed the last one. Um, it was also in the PowerPoint, but you know. So if I go to X-ray view, I can now see I selected the bottom of the bolt, and I'm going to sharpen that up to like 0.5. Yep. And we'll sharpen up all of these to like 0.5. Oops. X-ray view. 0.5. So those are all a lot sharper. You can see that looks a lot more reasonable for the reference image. Maybe even slightly too sharp in some places. That's pretty good. Now, from the front, the first problem we can see is that obviously the bolt here is like hexagonal, um, maybe even less. But we have a really rounded um, bolt because of the way that we pulled off the nozzle from the front. The way we're going to solve this is I'm going to select every other edge because we had 16 edges originally. If I select every other edge around the front, go to my front view and scale it holding shift Y so it won't scale in the Y, I can flatten out those edges and turn it into an octagon. And now we have an octagonal bolt. And then if we select the alternate edges and sharpen those, it should really sharpen up into a truly octagonal bolt. And so now we have a much more reasonable looking bolt for you know, the faceted tool that they would actually use to open up a fire hydrant, you know, the wrench. Words are hard. And the last little detail I think we missed in here is a little bit of a lip under the the bolt head there where the chain and the ring actually attaches. So in edit mode, I'll make a thin cut here, a slightly wider cut there, select the ring of faces, and then pull that in. And sharpen up our edges again. And that should give us that little ring cut out for the chain. So X-ray, turn off my X-ray, go back to object mode, and now we have a little ring cut out for the chain to attach to. Um, actually, the front of that little bolt cap looks more rounded than I made it, so I'll turn that down a little bit, make it a little bit more rounded. Cool. So, zooming out. Looking at our reference, the nozzle looks pretty good, maybe a bit too long. So when you're using reference photos, it's good to kind of go back and forth, make sure that your proportions look about right. So for box select, the shortcut for that is B for box select, which is pretty straightforward. 
box select. I'm going to select all these in the front, grab them on the Y, and bring them in a little bit, and then go back to object mode and see. That looks pretty good. Maybe the cap is a little too far away still, the little gap here. So let's go back. X-ray. If I tap A, it selects all. One more time. Should. Ooh. Yeah, should deselect all. And so I'm going to box select the front and bring that back a tiny bit just to make the gap there look more reasonable to the reference image. Cool. So now we have the nozzle from the front. Um, oh, the last step I missed is I didn't close up the bolt there. You can see that the just open face. So I'll select the ring of vertices around the front, scale it in a little bit, and then um, there are kind of two options I could go with here. I could either tap F to make a face, and that would make a flat face here. The thing you'll notice about that is it now has 16 sides. Any um, polygon that's not a quad or a tri, uh, a three-sided or four-sided object, is called an n-gon because it has a you know an n number of face or of faces or vertices around it. Um, on flat faces, it's not a huge deal because your graphics card will still turn that into a perfectly valid um, triangulated model for your GPU. The problem with n-gons comes in you can create complex surfaces that don't actually make um, actual sense in a Euclidean um, geometry. So if I were to go in here and just make like a worst case scenario, just as an example, subdivide some of these edges. I'm just going to grab some of these vertices randomly and pull them in weird directions. You can see that Geometrically, this object makes no sense. Like, there are no flat edges. When the computer goes to, there's a modifier to triangulate, you can see that what it's trying to do is turn these vertices into like a fan of triangles that spirals out from that middle point. But if you wanted that to be a flat face, there's no way to make a flat face out of non planar. Um, geometry that doesn't have three or four sides. It just mathematically doesn't work, so you can get some really weird distorted results. If I go into smooth shading, you can see that it does some really weird funky things because it doesn't quite know what's happening. Um, so ideally, you want to avoid n-gons in everything that you're doing. So I made this n-gon face at the front here. But what I can do is pull up, um, sorry, delete that face. What I actually want to do is extrude some new vertices in and then just merge them into the center. So to merge, Alt-M is merge, and I'm going to merge at center, and you can see whoop, it turns it into a triangular fan that meets right at the center of that ring. So now we have triangles that no matter what I do will be planar and not confuse the graphics card. And now we have a bolt. And I might even harden this edge a little bit so it looks more like a bolt. Cool. Hopefully I'm not overwhelming anybody. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Who knows? <laughs> We're doing good. Well, I'm okay. totally overwhelmed, but because it's <laughs> working. So uh, oh, you're, you're, you're recording, so we're good. Uh, well, sorry. <laughs> so. Uh, next thing we're going to do is going to be some of the outlets from the sides. So depending on the fire hydrant, you know, you can have some really weird funky shapes. So there's a lot of flexibility here. I, um, a lot of fire hydrants have them at the same level, but I kind of like the look of them being offset um, vertically. So I'm going to go for more of that kind of a look. So going back into edit mode, what I'm going to do is add a couple of edges up above this one, and we're going to start pulling out the um, the hydrant nozzle in this kind of a direction. That probably looked dirtier than it needed to do for a second there. <laughs> Delete that note. So, using a loop cut, I'm going to cut up top here, and you can see that 
loop cuts try to conform to the, the shape of the geometry that it's closest to. So up at the top here, because the face is mostly flat, the edges flatten out. But as I bring it closer and closer towards our rounded edge towards the bottom, it tries to meet it as a rounded edge. So we're going to bring it up a little bit. And I'm going to scale with S on the Z axis and just flatten that so we get a flat edge right up above. Oop. Helps if I actually hit Enter and confirm the scaling. That helps. So we have one edge at the top, and I'm going to do one more that's going to be the mid. That's not right, scale Z. One more that's going to be the midline. And then I'm just going to tweak these a little bit. I'm looking to have roughly square faces. Because if I have roughly square faces, that means that the um, geometry is not going to be um, either pinched because they're too um, vertically rectangular or stretched because they're too, um, yeah, if it was like this, they'd be really stretched out. You could have issues. If you had it this way where it was really thin, they could get pinched and create issues. So having an even spacing on your faces creates very smooth um, geometry that avoids pinching and stretching. So. <laughs> perfectly from the side. This one's going to be lower polygon count than um, the nozzle from the front. I'm just going to select four faces and delete them. And just like we did before, I'm going to go to our loop tools, circle, don't flatten, relax, and then circle again. And this should create a circular cutout in the edge of the surface that roughly conforms to the shape of our uh, cylindrical uh, body of the fire hydrant. Um, the only thing that I have noticed it's done is it's kind of pinched it inwards a little bit here. So I'm going to grab it on the x-axis this time and then pull it out to try to flatten those edges out a little bit. Um, and if you're not sure what axis um, you need to move along, green is Y, red is X, and you've always got your little bubble tool up here showing you which direction's which. Um, and if you were to grab and do Y, X, Z, you can switch and figure out which one you need if you didn't know, you know which way you were facing at any given time. So we have a cutout in the side that's going to turn into our little side nozzle. And for this, uh, I kind of like the bell shape on the yellow one here, so I'm going to kind of make a bell shape with this one. So, like we did last time, extrude, but this time along the X. Let's bring it out a little bit, scale it in a little bit, make that like rounded transition in, and then scale it on the X and flatten it. Um, the bell's got a little bit of a lip here, so let's make a little gap. We're going to make a lip, and then the bottom of the bell is going to be there. So let's select, whoop, what have I done? Graph X, lip, extrude, and that'll be the bottom of the bell. Yes, confused myself for a second. Select the ring of faces, extrude them, and then shrink them. And that will be our little lip for the bell there. And I'll go ahead and sharpen up those edges really quickly so it looks right. Yep, lip and then the bell. Now the bell has, it looks like a little bit of a bevel and then a taper and then it goes forward again. So let's scale this a touch, just a touch, and extrude it forward a little bit. Maybe even move it back a bit more with a taper there, which is like almost a 45 degree, maybe a little bit harsher than a 45 degree. Sharpen that up a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit less. And then the bell comes forward looking about, let's see, twice as far as the shape of the bell. So one, two-ish squares. So I'll do like four squares forward. Let's extrude X. Two, three, four, about, scale it in a little bit, and then maybe one more square because the bell kind of rounds off before the chain and the bolt. So extrude, X, one more square, and then let's scale that in for the chain. 
sharpen that up a bit, maybe a bit less. And so checking that this still looks pretty correct. Um, maybe it looks a little bit too long. So let's go ahead and box select this, flatten it out a little bit, maybe sharpen the bell a little bit more, maybe flatten the front of the bell a little bit more. That looks about right. So then we'll pull it forward for the bolt, do the similar, uh, do a similar thing with the bolt here and the little space for the chain as we did on the front. So extrude. X, that'll be the space for the chain gap. Extrude X, that'll be the little bottom of the bolt. And then extrude, and from the side, scale it in a little bit to where the bolt will be. And let's go ahead and make this lip while we're here, which might even be a little bit too thick. So we will bring it back. looks about right, maybe still a little bit too long. Grab X, back a little bit, and then we'll pull the bolt out. So extrude X and pull the bolt out. Now in this case, because we only have eight faces instead of 16, we won't scale in every other edge. We are just going to sharpen literally every edge. Now I can select each of these edges individually, but just like you can loop select by holding Alt and it selects any ring of edges or faces or vertices, if you want to do it the other way around, so instead of selecting a loop that's all end-to-end, um, -end, you want them that's all um, kind of parallel to each other, what you do is you hold Control and then Alt and it selects all of the, the edges that are parallel to each other in that ring. So I can select all of those edges and then sharpen those up and turn those into a bolt. So let's go ahead and start sharpening these faces a little more, or these edges a little more. And check our reference. So the gap, probably a little bit big and more rounded on the front. So let's bring that down a little bit and then X-ray, select everything and just bring it in a little bit more. And that looks pretty good. So now, ah, and then closing up the face of the bolt like I forgot to the first time. Scale mm -hmm. it in a little bit. And then merge it center so I have a little triangle fan and sharpen it. Whoa. Object mode. Cool. So we have a bell, we have a bolt. Um, I'm going to mirror at the very end to take this bell and copy it over to the other side. The reason I'm going to wait and do that until the end, um, because we're dealing with something that has radial symmetry, um, like axial symmetry, it, it's cylindrical. Trying to use the mirror modifier as well as do um, circular um, scaling for like the top here and the bottom will mess up some of the things that we're trying to do. It will scale f improperly. Um, so the easiest thing is going to be to go through, um, we're going to do the little, I call it a hat and like a base. So we're going to do the hat, the base, and then we will um, flip everything across the x-axis. So going through my notes, making sure I know where I am. Uh, insets, bolts, yep, 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 bell shape, hat and broom. Okay, so next step is we're going to make, I like to call this like the hat. It's got like a little brim and then a hat shape and then a little bolt on the top. Um, so to do this, back into edit mode, the hat here, we're going to extrude up a bit, Oop. extrude, up a bit, Oop. that's going to be the height of this little hat, 
and you can see that all of them have kind of different, so this one's pretty plain, it's just got a little edge, a rounded edge. This one's got like several layers of edges, like it almost looks like um, kind of fancy floor molding almost, where it's got all the little lips. That one's pretty simple. Um, that one's pretty fancy, that's actually similar to the yellow one. That one's kind of fancy. So there's some creativity here. So I'll actually show off a little technique for doing this like floor molding edge. So if I select this ring of faces, extrude, and just like we were insetting the lips in this one, I'm just gonna pull out with Alt S and create the brim. Now the brims on these seem to roughly line up with like the bottom of the bell or the bottom of the first nozzle cap thing there. So let me see if this a little bit too far. First nozzle cap there. Looks pretty good. Let me sharpen up these edges. Oop, I selected the wrong edges. That it that ring, that these rings. Sharpen them. And so to create this extra little detail, I will do a loop cut. With a loop cut, if you scroll your mouse wheel, you can actually tell it to do more cuts than one. So I'll do two to create an evenly spaced edge in the middle. It looks like this molding detail is a little bit lower than higher. So I moved it down a tiny touch. I'll scale this out like I did the other one. Quickly sharpen up these two edges, just a touch. And so now I have an edge in here where this surface meets this surface. There's an edge in between. And then underneath, I also have where this surface and this surface touch, there's a ring of edges here. Um, and I'm actually gonna go in my modifiers. If I press this little button on cage, it will actually show me my smoothed edges in edit mode, which makes it a little bit easier to see at times. So I can select these two edges that are gonna be in between. And what I wanna do, um, if you hit Control B, there is a tool called the bevel tool. So as I drag this out, you can see it's trying to bevel it, give it kind of a smooth transition with lots of edges. Again, if you scroll the mouse wheel, you can add more or fewer edges to that bevel. But if I do just one edge in between, make it about yay big, say. The problem with this is it's curving in to try to transition like smoothly rounding off this corner, but I don't want that. What I want is this like little um, floor molding effect. The profile here, option here, kind of tweaks how deep in or out the effect goes. So if I pull this down, it will pop out. If I go to zero, it pops out to like 90 degrees, which I don't want. So let's do it to like, 0.1, maybe 0.05. And now you can see I get this kind of extra pillow detail. And if I sharpen up the edges on either side of it, I now get that like floor molding detail effect in basically one step, which is really nice and useful. And so I like using that for a lot of like Victorian molding and things like that, just doing that bevel and then pillow it outwards effect. Super useful. So you got that detail there. So we might as well do the same thing on the bottom while we're at it, just to match it up. So on the bottom, extrude, scale it out. And so this looks like it goes maybe a little bit further than the hat does. So the hat stops there, that stops there-ish, that looks about right. We'll go ahead, grab, extrude that down a little bit. And then just like last time, we'll add a <coughs> edge. Extrude it out. Whoa, out. And then bevel these two edges to turn them into that little pillowed detail. and make sure that the profile pops it outwards instead of inwards. 
and then we can sharpen up all of these edges in between to really make sure that we're seeing that detail. Awesome. In fact, for this one, because it's so round, I might not even sharpen these two edges here. I might just leave them very rounded. Just remove the effect entire, the sharpening entirely. Maybe even add an extra edge in there and scale it out so it becomes like really rounded. Really rounded, but we still have the little extra pillow bevels. So it's got like shelves, stair steps of, of detail. And sharpen that bit. Object mode. Sharpen that bit. Cool. So we start on the hat, start on the base. The base is probably going to be the easiest to just quickly finish off now because literally all that these, all it does is it comes in a bit and then you can see on most of these, on most fire hydrants, you can kind of see a little bit of like the pipe heading into the ground sticking out the bottom. Um, yeah, a little bit of the pipe sticking out the bottom. So literally all I'm going to do, select the bottom edge, extrude and scale it in until it's like thinner than the body of the fire hydrant. Extrude and then grab that and just pull it straight down to make like the pipe sticking into the ground. Now we could go ahead and I will sharpen this. We could uh, cap this. So we could fill in the detail here, maybe add a little bit of piping and stuff and make it look detailed in here. But if this were to be going into a animated scene or into a video game or something, uh, unless you're expecting the fire hydrant to be, I don't know, knocked over by a car or, or destroyed in some way where you'd see inside of it, the pipe will be sticking into the ground and you'll never see under here. So ad adding any extra geometry to the bottom of the pipe would just be wasted processing power that you don't need to worry about. Um, so we could cap this or we could leave it alone. Um, in this case, I'm just going to leave it alone because why waste the processing power if you don't have to? So I'll sharpen up that, because you'll see this and maybe a tiny bit of the top of the pipe there. But if this were to be, actually, if that's the ground plane, let's move everything up a little bit. If this were to be sitting on the ground, let's add a little plane here. Let's reset the cursor and add a plane here. If this were to be sitting on the ground, there's the ground. All you'd see is maybe a tiny bit of the pipe, and the rest of it's just underground where you're never going to see it. So don't, just don't even worry about it. Um, yep. OK. So now we can move on to finishing up the hat, a little bolt on the top. So kind of go for this style. I kind of like the tapered stacks of bolts on the top instead of the sort of plain look here. So very rounded hat and then tapers the stacks. So it's like this. First thing I'm going to do is extrude and bring this straight up to make the top of the hat. I will scale this in until it's roughly how I think this should line up. Then add a loop cut and bring it up and scale it out again to make the hat more rounded properly. Uh, and in this case, I might actually use my bevel and set the profile back to half so it does the rounding um, just to have more holding edges, um, because otherwise you could see it would have really stretched edges, and this just squares off the edges a little bit more, avoids some of the stretching and pinching, which could potentially create problems. And I'm not adding that many faces by doing this um, to affect performance. And so we'll take this top one and then just flatten it out a little bit, tiny bit more, just to make it match up with the reference. Extrude up into the axis. Extrude and then scale it out to match like this little bell thing. 
And you see we're just using the same tools again and again. Very similar process the whole way through. Extrude up. Up. My computer's forming a little bit slower doing all the streaming and recording at the same time. Up and in. And so scale this in just a touch to go with that detail. And let's go ahead and sharpen these just a little bit so it looks closer to the reference. I tend not to like it looking too too rounded while I'm trying to work because it can get very distracting not being able to see my edges and not see the form of the geometry properly. So that's looking pretty close. So this will extrude up once more. And then we will do, it looks like a bolt, and then a tinier bolt on top for some reason. <laughs> because fire hydrants are weird. Scale in. Extrude up. And because this has 16 edges, same thing we did at the front nozzle, we're going to have to select every other edge and force this into a bolt shape. So select every other one. In this case, we can't do the um, loop selection that selects all the edges because we need every other one, not every edge. So scale, shift Z, so I'm not um, making them any less tall. They're going to be the same height. I just want to flatten them out in the other two axes. And then I'm going to sharpen the alternate edges to make the bolt shape. Wait. So this bolt obviously needs to be taller, maybe a little bit thinner even. That looks pretty much correct. And then tiny little nub on the top of it. So in this case, I will select all of them. Shift Z, scale and Shift Z so I don't scale it less tall, but make it thinner. And then make it a little bit taller. I'm going to extrude, scale in. Scale in. And because this bolt is like a little bit off center, this one I'll just grab and move a little bit off center and move it up. And we'll cap it like we did to the other ones because this one will be visible unlike the pipe. You will see the top of the fire hydrant. So extrude and then merge at center. And you get that triangle fan. So we'll go ahead sharpen these edges, and then on the bolt, sharpen the alternate edges so it will indeed look like a bolt. So we're getting pretty close now. Um, did I sharpen this edge? I did not. That's why that looks too rounded. Perfect. So the last things, the last details we're going to be adding here. Um, this hydrant doesn't have it. A lot of these hydrants have little beveled detail and these little scallop cuts. And in the hat, they have these little scallop cuts. Before I do that, so the first thing I'm going to do Loop cut, scale Z, zero to flatten it. Move it up a little bit more. We'll add the ledge. So similar to how we rounded this off, I'm literally just going to add a cut in the middle and then scale it out a bit. Whoa, too much. and sharpen. And so that should create a little ledge detail. 
Let's maybe even make it a bit bigger just to make it more prominent. And at this point, this is when I'm going to actually mirror what we've done across simply because um, to do little scallop cuts, because we have an even number of faces, the front face will be bisected incorrectly. So if I go to the front, um, there's actually two edges splitting here. So if I were to try to mirror this and I wanted the scallops to be, you know, every other edge, this edge would mirror and this would be twice as thick as the rest. So in this case, we will toggle x-ray delete half of the model. So I'm just box selecting half of it. Um, in fact, we may have to fix this little asymmetric detail afterwards. Uh, in fact, we definitely will have to fix this asymmetric detail afterwards. So I'll delete it and recreate it momentarily. Delete faces, split the model in half, and apply a mirror modifier. Now I want it to go before in the stack, before the subsurface, so that the smoothing doesn't happen before mirroring, it happens after mirroring, and then we'll apply the mirror. And so now the bell and everything has been flipped over, and we just have to fix up what we broke at the top here just a little bit. In this case, these I will merge in the center. These were spaced a little bit too far apart because we made them slightly asymmetric. <sighs> Fix this up and seal it up again. <clears throat> merging, merging. <sighs> Just move these asymmetric again. And that will have mirrored our model nicely. Now this looks a little bit funny being pit and bulged out like this, but we can actually use our sharpening at the base here to kind of solve that problem. So if I turn on my edges in edit mode and sharpen them a bit, they'll tighten in and remove some of the like excessively smooth look and look perhaps a little more natural. That might be a little too sharp, although maybe not because it does look like they look fairly sharp on a real reference model. So in fact, let's do the same thing here. Sharpen that up a touch. Maybe too much. There we go. And then the last thing will be these little scallop cuts, which are actually very simple to do. So to space them out, I'm going to be selecting, looking at this, I'm going to be selecting rows of faces, and it's going to be every other ring 
around just to give them that like spacing of scallop cut one, scallop cut one. We started with an even number of faces, so this should work perfectly. Yep. And the tool we're looking for is inset. The shortcut is I. And that was like an extrude, but it then pulls in along the the contours of every single face. So we now have an inset. And then using our push or shrink fatten, Alt S, you can scale that in. And now we have the scallop cuts just like that. We might want to sharpen these up a touch around the edges just to make them match a little bit more or maybe make them not quite so deep. We can turn down that for a second. So we could select the edges. <sighs> to sharpen these. Make them look a little bit closer to the reference, um, and maybe even sharpen up the middle. Just you missed one. Tiny. Did I? Oh no. Did I? You missed one edge. Oh yes, I did. Ah. Oh. Ah, <sighs> oh, the issues. Let me do the ones in between. And this one will be a little bit less because it's still more rounded in the middle. That would have driven me crazy if then I did that, like took it into the next course and had the wrong amount selected. There we go. And that looks pretty close too. And so the same thing will happen down here to add the scallop cuts underneath, literally just selecting every other face, insetting, and then sharpening to taste. So every other one. Now those edges there, some of those uh, faces are not parallel on either side because of previous work. You notice that? Yeah. So one of the solutions that we can do to this is if we select the whole ring under our loop tools, there is this one called spacing, which then spaces them all evenly apart, which should if they are unevenly spaced, fix up some of that issue. There might be some twisting, which then if we were to rotate on the z-axis, we could kind of undo the twisting a little bit. And that would pretty much restore the parallels. So the issue with that is because of the, uh, yeah, the rounding that we did up here, they became unevenly spaced. So I can space these and space these. And it makes sure that the distance between each of the vertices is exactly equal. And once we have these all inset, because they're going to be so rounded, it'll cover up little imperfections. So in this case, they are pretty much all parallel. So if I inset this, a little too much. Let's insert this not with the edit mode turned on, just so I can actually see what I'm doing. And then we will sharpen these to taste and hopefully not mess up the number of select edges this time. Select, 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 select. Nope. Select, select, select. Sharpen, yes, and then sharpen the inside a little bit. There are ways we could solve some of the pinching, but it would involve redoing a lot of the edges here in slightly more difficult ways. So basically creating a pill shape and then integrating it into the model, which would be a little bit advanced for a beginner kind of thing. So I'm going to 
in this case, I might just select all of these rings. And while I don't usually use a full one, eh, nah, I'll leave it. In this case, a small amount of pinching is going to be good enough for like a beginner's course. I might do is just soften these edges maybe just a tiny bit to reduce some of the harshness of the look. Yeah. There are dogs in the background. Uh. Before I lose everything, I might as well save this. All right, and I lied. The very last thing we're going to do is add the bolts, because there's a nice technique for adding radially symmetric details in Blender, which can be used for all kinds of things, not just bolts. So we're actually going to create this as a separate object to start with. So I will add cylinder, uh, but my cylinders, you can see the cursor has been moved again. I accidentally misclicked. So shift C resets the cursor. The other way to check on your cursor is in the view tab. You can see the 3D cursor's position and even set it to specific things. So I can actually move it around. So you could also right click and reset all the default values or just like select them one by one and zero them out as well, just to make sure that it is at the origin. So adding a little cylinder, this will be an eight sided bolt cylinder. And then I will scale it to look roughly like bolts. So moving it over, it needs to be much shorter, much smaller a little bit taller and move it into place. And I've kept it, so if I go to X-ray view, I've kept it completely on the X-axis. I was doing everything from the front view, so it's not been moved forward or back. It is locked on the X-axis. The reason being that when I go to rotate it, I know that if I were to rotate this like 60 degrees or 30 degrees for every time, it will come back to an even uh, number of degrees because it's on one of the uh, flat planes. So to do duplications um, parametrically, you add the modifier array. And so by default, it does basic. I can space it and copy it. Let's go ahead and add a top face just so it's sealed. So that would be like the most basic array. If you're doing like a picket fence, this would be really easy. You make one fence post and then just copy it along in a row. But you can do much more uh, interesting and dynamic effects with this because you can use an object as the offset. So what I'm going to do is turn off relative offset. I'm going to turn my count down to like three for now. I'm going to add with shift A an empty object, plane axes, and these are actually going to control our array modifier. So I want, to, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, Let's say six bolts, because then 360 degrees over six, that would be 60 degrees. Makes the math easy. So I've now rotated this along the z-axis, 60 degrees. So if I then go to our bolt and tell it to use the empty, it is now copying these every 60 degrees, because that rotation of this empty controls the array modifier. So if I now set this to copy six times, I now have six bolts rotated evenly spaced around 360 degrees to make them perfect. And because this is all dynamic, I only have one bolt mesh, so I could do anything to this bolt. If I wanted to you know, grab a face and make it pointy, they all become pointy. But what I can do, duplicate Steam it. Bolt. <laughs> yes. Duplicate it, move it underneath, so now I have bolts there. 
select all of these, duplicate it, and move it up to the top. And now, automatically, I have bolts over the whole thing. In fact, the ones at the top might be a little bit too close, a little bit further. But now they are all perfectly evenly spaced, and everything is dynamic. I will apply the array modifier, select first select the bolts, and then select the uh, fire hydrant sec second. So you can kind of see, it's hard to see, it would be easier to see on your own screens. The first thing I selected is bright orange at first, and then turns dark orange as I select something else. And so I've had a bunch of objects in my scene, like I select the empty next. The first two are dark orange, the last one's bright orange. The last one that you've selected, which is bright orange, and you can see in the outliner, it's the one that has the highlighted row, bright yellow, orange. That is your active object. So if I were to do anything like combine objects, they would combine into the active object. So I'll select the bolts first, then the fire hydrant to make the fire hydrant the active object, and join is control J, and that will join the, the bolts I made into this object, which means that it also gets the subdivision surface modifier that I applied to my fire hydrant. So now they're all smoothed and rounded out. Obviously, they're too smoothed and rounded out because I didn't sharpen them first like an idiot. But if I then go back through and sharpen these, shift If I start to sharpen these, they will then become sharpened. So I made the gross mistake of not doing the sharpening and stuff first. So I'm actually going to undo joining these and do that first because that will save me a lot of time and pain. I'm even gonna go back to before I applied the array modifier to the bolts. Come on. There we go, because then I only have to do this once to each of the bolts and then it will copy it to the other six. So add my sharpening to, actually I'm gonna do it to all the faces, so I'll just select all. Let's sharpen all of these. Then I can apply my array modifier and join it. And now when they're smoothed, they are all sharpened. One thing you will notice is that these bolts are really bump are really jagged, faceted looking, whereas the rest of the model is smooth. If I turn everything um, flat shaded, you'll see that they all become really jagged and not smooth. Smooth shading, they all become very smooth. If you join objects together and one of them is not um, smooth shaded, so let me add a monkey head. You can see she is definitely not smooth shaded, she is flat shaded. If I were to join her, she will get the subdivision modifier, but she will still be flat shaded, not smooth shaded. So you can have sections of your model that you manually set to flat shaded or smooth shaded if you're not using the automatic smoothing. I prefer the automatic smoothing because it makes life easier, but there are situations where you might want to manually set some faces that aren't the correct angle to force them to be flat shaded. So we can, you know, get rid of the monkey. We don't need the monkey. Oh God, the eyes stayed behind. <laughs> no, <laughs> we can get rid of the monkey. Save our project, and now we have a fire hydrant. Woot. I can even turn on some of the extra shading options just so it's a little bit easier to see the depth and detail on here. We have a fire hydrant. And so, because we're using a subdivision modifier, the polygon count, let's move this out of the way, down at the bottom uh, with my settings all the way up at five is currently three and a half million triangles, uh, 1.7 million faces. However, if I hide it, our underlying geometry is less than 2,000 faces, less than 3,000 triangles. This model would be 
perfectly fine for a video game. In fact, we could probably go with an even higher resolution uh, model in a modern video game, at least for our close-up LODs. And then we can bake down the details from the high resolution onto it to make it look smoother, which we're going to do next week. But you can see that in one step, without having to do uh, the model twice, we get our low poly and we get our high poly all together in one go. So, yeah, we have a fire hydrant. That was probably really slow and boring, and I probably lost people along the way, but 